Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming out on this beautiful spring day in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. I know you'd uh, rather be outside, I'm sure, in the great cloudy, damp, cold weather, but uh, I appreciate you coming on inside to, to hear a little bit about a great, exciting topic, lobbying in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, you know, I thought it was bad when we had to talk about politics in Wisconsin, but we're talking about lobbying in Wisconsin. Uh, but I appreciate your interest because, quite honestly, lobbying and grassroots efforts on behalf of businesses and organizations and individuals are a very key part of our legislative lawmaking process in the state of Wisconsin, at the federal level, and even at the local level. And all of you, in many ways, are lobbyists in yourself. And the work that you do on behalf of the chamber, the organizations that you represent and work for, and even uh, for your, yourself as an individual. When you communicate with a public official and you try to sway them in regard to a decision that you'd like them to make or to understand your position on an issue, that's lobby. Uh, it comes in a number of different forms and we're gonna talk about that today, but I really appreciate your interest and your um, understanding that lobbying and connecting with your legislators is a very important thing. As Steve mentioned, uh, I'm Joe Lipom, and I think I know most of you in the room, but I'm humbled enough to understand that some of you may have forgotten me already. Um, and that's maybe I haven't met some of you. Uh, as Steve mentioned, a little bit more on my background, I was born and raised in Sheboygan, uh, one of 13 kids here in the Sheboygan area. Worked for the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce, actually. My first job after graduating from UW-Madison was to work for the chamber. Great experience. I was the membership director and really got to know a lot of the good businesses and organizations in Sheboygan County. Decided then to go work for one of those great Sheboygan County businesses, Sargento Food. It's foods, excuse me, I spent about six years in their food service division. Great family, great company, great experience. It was while at the chamber that I was encouraged to, at the age of 23, run to be a city council member and uh, had a very interesting first campaign but was successful in earning that first district assembly seat. Represent, or, uh, Mayor Vandersteen also represented the first district for a while. So I served on the city council for seven years and then while working at Sargento uh, in 1998, a good part of the community came and said to me, Joe, you know, we like what you're doing at the city council level. Had you ever thought about running for the state a legislature. Um, the seat had opened up. Then Representative Baumgart was running for the state Senate and the assembly seat, which hadn't been represented by a Republican in over 46 years, was open. And they came to me and said, Joe, you should run as a Republican for this seat. You know, it's a great opportunity. I quite honestly got into it not thinking I'd win, but we ran a very aggressive campaign. And I remember waking up on election day in 1998 thinking, I think I might win tonight and I might be going to the legislature and having to leave Sargento. Did that, served in the assembly for four years, uh, enjoyed that experience, but was very frustrated as well. That's when Chuck Qual and Scott Jensen were the leaders of the legislature. And quite honestly, I was like, you know what? I'm better than this. I don't want to be a part of this mess. And I was about ready to leave. And then I thought, you know what? I'm not a quitter. I'm going to try to make a difference. So I decided to run, give up my assembly seat, which had become quite safe at that time give up my Senate assembly seat and I ran for the Senate, again, incumbent Senator Jim Baumgart. And so Jim and I had a very intense campaign. I ended up winning by 23 votes on, um, in 2002. And with that 23 vote margin, I was, help, I was able to help bring in a new majority. The Republicans took majority of the Senate at that time. Uh, we kicked out Chuck Kuala as the majority leader, which was one of my goals. And we were able to bring kind of a new sense of leadership to the Wisconsin State Senate at the time. Served for 12 years in the Senate. Great experience, a uh, number of leadership positions. Served on the Finance Committee, which is the Budget Committee, which we'll talk about for uh, four budgets. And really just uh, had an awesome time, but also knew it was time to get out after 12 years. And so I ran for Congress, came up in that vote, 200 votes short in a primary. Um, but then had the opportunity to land this opportunity at Foley and Lardner and have really enjoyed the transition and the experience now serving as a government affairs lobbyist for Foley and the clients that we serve. My wife Heather and our three children continue to reside in Sheboygan, so we have a main office or my main office for Foley's in Madison, but our headquarters is in Milwaukee, so I'm either in Milwaukee or Madison or Sheboygan uh, on a daily basis. I still am doing my 20-year uh, commutes to Madison on a regular basis and Therefore, I'll continue to tell you why I support the expansion of Highway 23. And I'm glad that we're finally getting that done. 
So um, at Foley and Lardner, again, we are a nation, a worldwide law firm. We are the oldest and largest law firm in the state of Wisconsin. We have offices across the United States and around the world, which is really exciting. I'm not an attorney. I'm one of the few people that work at Foley in a leadership position that's not an attorney, but just a great group of folks that I work with. Um, at a number of our facilities, Wisconsin, Florida, Texas, you can read them there, we have what are called government solutions teams. So back when Mike Greeby, you might recognize that name, a good friend of uh, Governor Walker and a good Republican in Wisconsin, he was the chair of our firm, and he realized that, you know, it's not always the smartest thing for uh, a client to fight the law. Maybe we could work to change the law to try to convince legislators or lawmakers to see things differently. And so they started what was called the Government Solutions Group, and again, we have practices now throughout the nation. Uh, I have the privilege and pleasure of leading the Wisconsin group. We are a team of three individuals, uh, myself as the, as the lead of the group or the manager of the group. And then I'm joined by two great colleagues, Jenny Malcor. Jenny was a uh, member of the Walker administration. She served as the deputy secretary at the Department of Health Services and then also served uh, for numerous Republican legislators, including current finance chair, John Nigren. And Jason Childress uh, is the Democratic side of our team. Jason grew up in Democratic politics in Wisconsin, worked, worked for Chuck Koala, used to actually run campaigns against me and try to defeat me uh, from the Democratic side. We're now good colleagues and good friends. And Jason has just great contacts. He's a really good friend of Governor Evers and a lot of the leadership now in the Democratic administration. So Jason, Jenny, and I, again, the government affairs team, we are three of 570 currently licensed lobbyists in the state of Wisconsin. There are 570 people that on a, every two-year basis uh, have to license to be lobbyists in Wisconsin. We'll talk about what that means. But we then are employed by what are called principles. And there are 697 lobbying principles in the state of Wisconsin. If you are an organization, a business, a chamber, an individual that employs a lobbyist and pays a person to lobby for them, then you have to register as a principal in Wisconsin. So again, you can look at the sheet that I provided to you. This is our current list of clients that we represent at Foley in Wisconsin. It's an aggressive list I'll, I'll share with you. Uh, but all of those groups, you know, everybody from Aurora Healthcare, who I represent down to the Boys and Girls Clubs of Wisconsin, they pay people, myself, Jason, or Wendy in our case, and we lobby on their behalf, we monitor legis the legislature on their behalf, and therefore they have to register as a principal lobbying organization in the state of Wisconsin. I just list for you, again, you can look at our list and the diversity of the clients that I represent, but a lot of chambers and communities, counties and towns directly employ lobbyists as well. So whether it be you know, the League of Municipalities down to specific cities, counties, uh, economic development organizations, you know, again, those 697 principles make up a great diverse group of individuals, businesses and organizations in the state of Wisconsin. Again, you are a lobbying principal if you're an organization which employs and pays a lobbyist. And that's when you have to register to be a principal. As an individual lobby, as an individual, you need to have a lobbying license if you attempt to influence state legislation or administrative rule on behalf of a business that pays you. So on behalf of a principal. When Aurora contracts with me as a contract lobbyist, I then have to register as a lobbyist because I try to influence the legislature and the state government on their behalf. A second trigger for that though is you, you can work for a principal and you don't have to register for a lobbyist if you keep your communications with a state official or a legislative employee to less, to five days or less. So after your fifth day of communication, and again, it's days. So sometimes smartly clients don't want to register a lobbyist. And so they'll hire us and say, you guys have to get all your communication done on this issue in five days. And so we book five full days of visits with legislators. And that allows them to not have to register us as lobbyists uh, because we meet that five day minimum uh, in a six month reporting period is what it is. Not most people don't do that, but some, some organizations just don't want to you know, have the reputation that they've got a lobbyist hired or whatever it may be because it's so sinister. 
Um, but uh, you know, most, most organizations will register, but some do push it and try to keep all communications under that five days. <clears throat> there are certain items that are not considered lobbying in Wisconsin. So um, most of you in this room are not lobbyists. Is anybody else in the room a registered lobbyist? I don't believe so. you are. Okay, there you go. Robin it is. There you go. Who do you lobby for? AT&T. You do, for AT&T. Great, you guys do a great job. So who was my old contact at AT&T? Right, yes. Yeah, no, the, the local lady that used to be here all the time. Julie. Julie, yeah. I got a, had a great relationship with Julie when, she, when I was in the legislature. And we work well with Kent, too. Um, so everybody else other than myself and Robin, you are allowed to do a number of things uh, in Wisconsin without having to register as a lobbyist. If you're trying to procure work from the state of Wisconsin in a contract, so you want to... Uh, build a building for the state or you want to do the cleaning services for the state of Wisconsin and getting a contract you don't have to register for a lobbyist for that as a lobbyist for that if you communicate with your own personal state representative or senator so any of us in this room can go and talk to uh, Senator Lemihu, Senator Strobel, Representative Kotsma, Vorpagel any of those guys we can talk to and it doesn't trigger lobbying laws if you communicate with the governor's office about executive appointments so the governor has to appoint secretaries and 200 some people the new governor is appointing you can talk to him or his staff as many times as you want about individuals for executive appointments and you can contact legislators on your own on behalf of a group like the chamber or a business um, as long as you're not getting paid if you're an unpaid volunteer there's no requirement to register uh, you know you can do that as many times as you want the five-day trigger again only kicks in if you're being paid uh, as a paid lobbyist. <clears throat> um, the government tries to make a little bit of money off of lobbying and uh, that, that helps to fund what's called the Wisconsin's Ethics Commission and so again there are fees associated with being a principal in Wisconsin or a lobbyist. So again if you're a principal organization like Augusta Development which uh, employs me uh, they pay $375 then they would um, also pay $125 every two years to authorize myself to lobby on their behalf. So again, you can see the principal registration and the principal fee to authorize a lobbyist. That's the basic fee for the business. Every two years, Foley and Lardner or whoever the company is that employs the lobbyist, they also have to pay a fee. That's the $400 fee that Foley would pay for me and Jason and Wendy individually to be able to lobby in Wisconsin. Now, if you're a principal, a small organization, or you're going to spend less than $500 totally in your lobbying efforts, uh, you can get a, a smaller principal fee, which is a $20 limited principal. And again, you have to monitor and spend less than $500 in that two-year period. I remember when I was on finance, I never, and I, I didn't even support this because I never liked revenue increases, but one year they're like, we need some more money, let's jack up the lobbying fees and we can get more, uh, more general purpose revenue into the state coffers by taking advantage of the lobbyists. Lobbying in Wisconsin, it's really actually a cool thing. Uh, I mean, you know, again, most people have very negative thoughts about lobbying and really lobbyists get a bad name. In Wisconsin, we have some of the most extensive, or we do have the most extensive lobbying laws, reporting laws in the nation. Um, you know, we aren't able to provide anything of value to the legislators or to the policy makers that we meet with. I mean, a cup of coffee is off the limits, which is a little bit ridiculous. And if we want to have a legislator come in and talk and have a cup of coffee, officially they're supposed to be sliding us a dollar or whatever it is. Uh, but nothing of value. That's actually been in place in Wisconsin since 1951, I believe. Many states you can buy. I hear from when I was in the legislature, I would hear about this, about how, oh man, you should be a legislator in you know, Louisiana. Um, because they can just whine and dine them like crazy and spend whatever they want on lobbyists. They would tell me that, you know, on a given night you could go from um, restaurant A, B, and C and there was an open tab from client A, B, and C and the legislators would go in there and just get fat and drunk and um, somehow not be swayed by, by, that, uh, by that purchase. But in Wisconsin we can't do anything like that. I mean, there's nothing. That, that can happen there. We have more disclo excuse me, disclosure laws than any other state in the nation, which I'll detail in a little bit. 
And again, we are overseen and monitored very closely by the Wisconsin's Ethics Commission. So again, whether you're a principal or a lobbyist, you have to, uh, I mean, it's just quite honestly overly detailed what we have to do. So for every principal that I represent, as you can see, and we do this as a benefit to our, as a service to our clients, we do all this reporting. But every, within 15 days of me talking about any issue, not even a specific bill, but if, you know, again, um, uh, I'm going to bring up another client. Quick Trip wants me to talk to a legislator about um, frozen pizza. I have to, within 15 days of talking to that legislator about frozen pe pizza, I have to put a, a report into the Ethics Commission saying that Joe, on behalf of Quick Trip, is talking about frozen pizza. There's not even a legislative connection or a legislative bill connected to it, but any topic, <laughs> any bill, any administrative rule, as, long, as soon as I have one contact, or it would be my, my fifth day or sixth day of contacts, obviously, but within 15 days, you have to report that. Every six months, myself and Jason and Wendy and all the other lobbyists, we have to submit a very detailed lobbyist time report that details every minute, basically, of what we do in lobbying. Uh, before the legislature or the governor. So we have to keep track of all of our, what's called lobby meetings, or excuse me, um, yeah, lobby meetings. And that's a specific entry that we have to make. And then if we're doing lobby prep, like if I'm prepping before I go in to meet with the governor, I have to keep track of that time. So if I spend a half hour prepping a document for talking to the governor about, that has to get submitted under what's called lobby prep. And that's all documented every six months. And then um, every principal, again, is required to complete a, so we, we submit our lobbying time reports, and then the principals that employ us have to submit lobbying activity and expenditure reports that hopefully match up with what we're reporting. So I'm reporting that I'm doing so much lobbying for client A, client A then has to send in, or principal A has to send in a report saying we spent $5,000 in the past six months on lobbying, and it needs to match up with what I've reported. So a lot of detail, a lot of reporting, which is a great thing. Um, all of this information is available to the public. So if you haven't ever been to the um, lo Eye on Lobbying website in Wisconsin, really, a, a, again, Wisconsin, I learned this in the legislature, and hopefully you know this as well as a citizen. I mean, we make so much information available to the public in Wisconsin if you just take advantage of it and look for it. And it's really not even that hard to find. So you can go to the Eye on Lobbying website. This is, again, as part of the Wisconsin Ethics Board. In there, you can find out who is all lobbying in Wisconsin, uh, who's registered lobbyists. You can go in and you know, find out specifically what I or any other lobbyist is doing, who we're lobbying on behalf of. You can go in and see our six-month reports. So you can go in and see that you know, back in December of 2018, I you know, lobbied on um, the special session bill you know, for 30 minutes in front of Senator Fitzgerald. That's all documented and that's all available to the public. And again, while that's a lot of reporting and documentation, it's really a good thing because it keeps us all uh, available. All, everything that we're doing to the public, there's nothing that can be secretly done. You know, again, there's no meeting that I can have with a legislator that isn't documented. There isn't an issue that I can talk to a legislator about that isn't documented. Um, and it's important to have that because there are a lot of lobbying activities taking place in Wisconsin. Last year, in the last two-year session, so the legislature works in two-year sessions, uh, there was $70 million spent by principled organizations in lobbying. Now, again, I think it's important that that's not $70 million that we're giving out to legislators, you know, in cash or in, in, in checks. This is what they're paying individuals to lobby on their behalf. So whether it be the... Um, Aurora Healthcare or the Boys and Girls Club, uh, cumulatively, all those organizations spent $70 million in, in lobbying activities. The top efforts um, oftentimes are the same throughout the years. So the Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce, the, the statewide chamber, they are the largest lobbying organization um, in, in regard to dollars spent. And I think that's been consistent, you know, maybe dipped a little bit during the Doyle years. Um, but they are um, an active source. So they spent uh, $1.4 million 
on their lobbying efforts in 2017-18. The Wisconsin Hospital Association spent 1.3. These are the three largest. And then, um, but I just wanted to show you this because of the diversity last two years, or the past two years, you know, kind of this unknown grassroots group sprung up and it was called Marcy's Law for Wisconsin. So that is a father of an individual who was um, assaulted and was a crime victim. And he invested $1.2 million in Wisconsin in the past two years to try to get what's called a Marcy's Law passed. It's not connected to any business. He's not connected to any organization. He was a dad that had the resources and the ability, and he's going nation or state by state across the nation and investing and in trying to get a Marcy's Law passed. You know, so again, it can be business-related issues, healthcare, education-related issues, down to crimes rights victims issues that individuals employ lobbyists for. Um, just to wrap things up here, you know, we, I think, do an effective job in the lobbying corps. Again, we are there because most of the organizations that hire us can't and really shouldn't have a full-time individual in the Capitol monitoring legislation, um, paying attention to the issues that are before them, um, and that's why they hire us. But I'll tell you, after my 16 years of experience in the legislature and now four plus years uh, doing actual lobbying work, it's still really in Wisconsin comes down to grassroots contact. I mean, you know, some people criticize me when I went from the legislature to lobbying saying, oh, you've got way too much direct influence. I've got friendships, but I can tell you when I was in the legislature, never once did I vote on a certain issue a certain way because a lobbyist was asking me to do it a certain way. Um, never once did I change my vote. I mean, a lobbyist, I, I, I didn't even share that, I don't think. Um, we, maybe I forgot that. Yeah, we can't give contributions to, we, we, we're, our freedom of political involvement or expression is taken away from us because we're lobbyists. So we can only give personal contributions to legislative candidates, to gubernatorial candidates in a real small window of time. Uh, we're, we're most of the two-year period, we can't write checks or p participate in the political giving process. You know, but even if that, even when you can do that, you know, the maximum that an individual can give to a state senator is two thousand well, dollars. Again, I was never going to have my principle or my view compromised for two thousand dollars. I appreciate the two thousand dollars that you invest in me, but my position was my credibility, my philosophy was worth a lot more than $2,000 that any individual was going to be able to give to me. So I, I just would share with you as, a, as an organization and as individuals that that's really where it comes down to. I mean, one of the things that I think I've been effective in doing for our clients is that I try to, as while I do a lot of work behind the scenes for them, just about everybody that I represent, I say, you gotta get the face of your organization into the legislative offices. So whether it's Quick Trip, bringing the people down from behind the counter, or um, you know the Boys and Girls Club, that's where I was this morning being a little bit late, we um, are participating in the Joint Finance Committee hearing down in Janesville today. So we've got um, seven different Boys and Girls Club ad administrators and three kids from clubs there to testify. That's much more effective than me that I'm ever going to be able to do. And again, I say that both as a lobbyist and even more specifically as a former representative, a former senator. I valued the information and the background and the point of view that lobbyists gave to me. But my last gut check before I voted on anything was where my constituents were. And because I knew I had to go home. I mean, I'm, I'm, I was, um, I'm getting paid as, lobby, as a legislator. I had to go home and explain how I was voting to the people at the cash register at the grocery store you know, and at the doctor's office, whatever it may be. So don't lose sight of that. We have a great legislative contingent uh, here in Sheboygan County. They're working hard for us. Um, Senator Lemieux, who succeeded me in the Senate, uh, he is the senator for the 9th Senate District. Senator Strobel, uh, representing the 20th Senate District. Representative Kotsma, the 26th Assembly District. Representative Vorpagel, the 27th Assembly District, and Representative Ramthun from the 59th Assembly District. Uh, we're well represented. They are all younger members of the legislature, um, but that's a good thing. And um, again, we should be really proud in Sheboygan County. We have, um, like when I was there, we probably got the best legislative contingent in regard to committee placements 
and um, key responsibility areas of any county in Wisconsin. So right now we have three members of our contingent, Senator Strobel, Senator Lemihu, and Representative Kotzma. They're members of the Finance Committee. Uh, that is uh, that, that happened when I was there. Myself, Senator Grothman, and Representative Lemihu were on the Finance Committee. But it's rare for one county to have that much influence on the Finance Committee. It's a 16-member committee, uh, 12 members from the majority, four members from the minority. And so when you've got three majority party members on the Finance Committee, quite honestly, there's nothing that as a county we shouldn't be able to get done if we work it right with them. And that's, I think I looked at Adam and a lot of people in the room, we got a lot done for Sheboygan County when we had uh, this last type of representation on the Finance Committee. So with that, that's basically the background on lobbying that I wanted to share. Um, and then if I can, I'll just share a little bit in regard to the clients that I work for. And just some, I like to uh, just give some case studies. So again, um, on the front page, uh, you know, again, Jason, Jenny, and I do represent a good number of individuals. So it's kind of like my legislative job where you have to be able to compartmentalize things by 30 minutes and move from one issue to the next. Um, you know, some great companies that I represent. Uh, Alexander Company and Owl 8. Many of you maybe know Joe Alexander. He's done a number of investments here in Sheboygan County, historical building redevelopment. Joe is uh, very supportive of maintaining the historic tax credit in the state of Wisconsin, which has been threatened over the past couple of years. Um, I've worked for Joe and for Owl 8 for uh, all four years now that I've been with Foley. Um, you know, international companies like American Express and General Motors, I have the privilege of representing. Boys and Girls Club of Wisconsin. As you can see, we've got a, a great relationship with the state of Wisconsin and the Boys and Girls Club, uh, but we're trying to expand that programming support. We really believe that we reach a great um, contingent of Wisconsin children that we serve after school, and we've been in a, in a very effective, cost-effective way, been able to provide great reading and math services to them, graduation-related services, uh, and so we're, we're working on a number of legislative interests there, as you can see. Um, Quick Trip, a great uh, Wisconsin-based company, so I uh, have the privilege of, of representing Quick Trip. We work on a number of different items. Johnson Controls, one of the largest country, companies in the world. Um, we work on behalf of, down to small groups, I think this is a great story. The Midwest Association of Camps on page four or five, whatever it is there. This is a group of about 100 privately owned summer camps in the state of Wisconsin. So these are just really cool people. They're mostly couples who met at camp when they were kids, went to camp for two weeks or two months um, in Wisconsin. They met their spouse, and now they're young families that bought these camps, multi-million dollar properties and businesses. They bring thousands of kids and families to Wisconsin every summer, and they are the make or break for a lot of communities across the state of Wisconsin. But most people don't even know about them. You know, you know there's that sign saying uh, Birch Tree Camp up north on the end of the road that you drive down sometimes. Well, that's a multi-million dollar business. And I actually worked with them when I, when I was in the legislature, and they came to me and said, Joe, we just really think we need to be better understood as a part of Wisconsin's economy. I mean, we're, we're kicking in a lot of cash or you know, doing a lot for the state. We're employing a lot of people, but no one knows about us. And they're actually regulated not like a camp. They're regulated like a daycare. And that's not what they are. They're a place where kids go for two weeks and you know, learn about having a great life outside in Wisconsin. So that's just been a great, they're a very small organization, but they put together their resources and they've invested in us and we've gotten a lot of good stuff done for them uh, over the past two years. And then the last company that I point out is our, my former employer and uh, a great company in Wisconsin is Sargento Foods. So Louie and uh, the Gentine family and I got to know each other real well when I was in the legislature and when I worked for them. Uh, they came to me back in 2015 and said, Joe, we'd like to continue to have you help us uh, do work for us in the state of Wisconsin. And so they've uh, engaged me now as a lobbyist for four years. Uh, key to Louie is you should know this as well, because I mean, he really was a key investor um, over the past four years in maintaining a focus on ensuring Highway 23 got to the point where it is, hopefully right now and uh, we'll see it to completion. So they've invested in me for four years now, and as some of you know in the room, I helped to lead a, a multi-county coalition on behalf of Sargento, um, you know, again, paid for by Sargento, did a lot of work with the legislators to get Highway 23 to the point that it is, where now it looks like it's finally gonna break ground and uh, move forward here in 2019. 
So those, again, are just some of the folks that I represent, the issues that we work on. And really, I'd be happy to just open it up now to any questions that you may have. Otherwise, I can give you just a quick snapshot on what's happening in the legislature prior to your visit with legislators in May. Adam. Joe, so I'd just like to say how much I appreciated your leadership as a representative and senator. You were always so good about working with us. And although we may not have always agreed, you always were striving to do good things for the community, and I appreciate that. Thanks. I also appreciate the tremendous job you've done <coughs> supporting, keeping the focus on Highway 23 and much of the work you've done behind the scenes to keep that going. And my question is, in terms of Tom Wagner and I were just having the same conversation last week, Obviously, great news. Looks like ground's going to break finally in May. Right. And many people in the community aren't going to believe it until they see the shovels in place. I'm right with you. <laughs> but uh, one of the questions that we've kicked around a little bit is why do you think the Thousand Friends didn't submit a follow up lawsuit? Um, I mean, I, I, I kind of know their group, their organization just decided that they were going to take a different focus and that they weren't going to continue their investment in Highway 23. When they began the lawsuit, now four years ago or whatever it is, and that's because they had one or two key board members and investors in, and he kind of said, I'm gonna invest in you and this is gonna become an issue of yours. And they followed suit. But I think again, as an organization, they just realized that it wasn't the right fight um, it's an important highway. It's a safety issue that they had to focus on. I mean, again, the coalition knows, and you were a part of that, Adam, I and mean, we tried to infiltrate that a little bit as well. So we identified over the past three years, four years, individuals that were members of the Friends of Wisconsin that were investing in that group. And we went to them and said, do you know that's the group that's stopping Highway 23? And most of them didn't know that. You know, again, it's a, it's a group that you invest in, but you don't really understand or follow what they're all doing, every single issue. So we had a number of those individuals contact the board and contact the organization and say, you know, this isn't, we don't want you to fight this any longer. And I think that together, plus good work by DOT. I mean, they did a great job uh, refining the EIS, the Environmental Impact Statement, and really addressed every issue that Judge Edelman had brought before the court in regard to why he thought um, Highway 23 wasn't ready to go move forward. So I think it was just a good combination of everything. Now, like you, Adam, I, I am not going to rest or believe it until I see actually pavement being put down or actually until we're driving on it. Because I would not be surprised if something else comes up along the way here, an environmental issue, or you know, we'll run across a, a, to a toad that we have to worry about or uh, you know, <laughs> something like that. I was the legislator along with Jim Baumgart, Senator Baumgart, back in, so I was 26 at the time. We got 23 enumerated. So that was the huge first step back in 1999. Spent a lot of political capital on that, to tell you the truth. Um, never did I think that it would then take you know, 20 years to get this project actually going. But it's just been a mess. I mean, it was um, the rating of funds for a while from the Transportation Department, and then the lawsuit that really just bogged this thing down to the point where it's been now 20 years. Mayor Vanderstein. You know, uh, when you were in the legislature, your office helped us put together something called Broward State in Madison. Right. It was a group uh, effort to uh, bring Sheboygan down to Madison for a day, uh, have a celebration around our favorite product, Broward, and uh, was led by the Chamber of Commerce at that time. Somewhere around 2004 or six, they stopped having it. Now, you've seen many other communities come to the legislature and have their day in the state capitol. Uh, are we missing the bullet by giving this up? Was it an effective way for Sheboygan to promote themselves and give not only businesses but residents a chance to meet with legislators in a very comfortable atmosphere? So just a little feedback on that. Maybe you're kind of feeling that should we try to revive it or is it better leaving it go? Right. Yeah, Bratte and Madison is great. I started doing that when I was a member, an employee of the chamber, and we'll go down as a staff with then Barb Lillison and the group down there, Mike, you'll remember. And we had a great advocacy day or afternoon. Uh, the legislators would all come to John Nolan Park. We played softball, a bipartisan game of softball, and then had a great brat fry and uh, really enjoyed uh, kind of that relationship time with our legislators. Um, I'm just trying to remember why it, why it all died. Most events like that have really kind of died in the Capitol. Um, again, it's important to have ethics laws, but the ethics laws have gotten so petty and specific. I mean, you have to now, you can't, a legislator can't come 
and have a soda or a brat without ensuring that they've paid their six dollars. I mean, it's just so detailed and processed that it's hardly effective. And most legislators are like, you know what, I'm not going to end up on the front page of the Sheboygan Press because I didn't pay four dollars for my brat, you know, when I went to Sheboygan Brat Day. It just isn't worth it. Um, so most events like that, like um, Brat Day, Chippewa Valley Rally was a big thing. Those things have really kind of died out. You know, I think it would be worth thinking about what's a way to, to regenerate or re rejuvenate something like that because it was fun. You know, again, that's part of the sad part of the legislature. There's very little fun that happens <laughs> down there. <laughs> um, you know, people don't really talk or get along, and it's worse now than it probably ever has been. So, you know, that would be a nice welcome relief. But again, there's so much scrutiny and pettiness placed on, you know, and again, did, did legislator A have two beers and all that stuff? I mean, it just got to be uh, an unfortunate hassle in that regard. Yep. Yeah. So, would you be willing to take us through, uh, let's say, a lobbying day for you where uh, a company or organization uh, contacts you and, and they give a reason for why they need more exposure or whatever it happens to be? And sure. Then ultimately, when you go to legislator A or whatever it is, what's that conversation? Happy to. So I can just tell you, so today's Friday, right? So on Wednesday, um, General Motors uh, is a client of mine, and we spent the entire day at the state capitol having the uh, regional government affairs representative of General Motors uh, visit, um, I think we were in eight different Senate offices uh, in the capitol. We have a bill that um, we'd like to defeat um, that we don't, we don't think would be good to us as a manufacturing company of automobiles in the state of Wisconsin. And so we think our chances, and this is part of what I get hired to do, is I try to evaluate where do you think we can you know, get something passed or where can we kill it if we have to. So I try to develop that strategy, and then we spent the day going into those eight different Senate offices who we felt might be uh, of, of interest to our point of view on the bill. And uh, the gentleman's name is Brian. So Brian and I go in and, you know, I try to, one of the, one of the maybe the advantages that I have as a former member, um, there's a, some members there that I worked with. So in that case, I'll take the lead and just say, hey, you know, Van, good to be with you. You know, Brian's here to talk to you about our bill. And really, Brian, the, the client, does the job of telling the story. Again, I think it's much more important for them, for the senator to hear it from them than for me, because they know I'm paid and, um, you know, that's, that's my job, but it come, it's much more passionate and um, I think poignant if it comes from the client directly. So we, you know, spent those uh, the whole day actually in the Capitol talking to those eight different senators, feel good about how the meetings went, and uh, my job is to kind of follow up with those senators and monitor the bill on their behalf um, to make sure that it doesn't move, you know, out of the committee, uh, hopefully, over the next couple months. So that's maybe a little bit of what I do is every day, and I did this when I was in the Senator, so it's kind of a nice transition. You know, I, I monitor every bill that's introduced or considered for, for introduction. I then email out to all my clients that would have an interest in that bill saying, hey, is this something that's of, you know, specific interest to you or what level of interest would you have? And then if they say, yeah, that's something that we want to support and get behind, then that's where I develop a strategy for that. If it's something that we want to kill, then I work to develop that strategy. That's basically kind of a day in the life of. And then I will say, I mean, I do, on behalf of a lot of our clients, go to legislative uh, listening sessions and stuff like that. So I kind of travel around the state today. I was down in Janesville, like I said, for the, for the Boys and Girls Club, participating in the state budget hearings. Mark. So are, are, are there any you know, times when either you or from your colleagues or Foley as a firm say, hey, we're just not, that's too dicey of a topic, we're just, we're going to take a pass, let somebody else lobby. Yes, we do. Yeah. And actually, so that's one of the cool things about working for Foley. Um, we're a very conservative firm, um, even though we've hired some people in the past that people have scratched their head at and say, well, why did you hire him or her? But uh, we're a very conservative firm overall, we're, which I really enjoy. Um, and knock on wood, when you look at my issue list, to date, there hasn't been an issue that I've been asked to lobby on, uh, lobby on that conflicts with my principles or political philosophy, and that's just been a great coincidence. I'm certain the day will come where I'm going to have to be like, <laughs> I can't believe I'm lobbying for this side when, quite honestly, as an individual, I'm against it. But you have to do that. That's part of the job. I've just been lucky that every issue that I've been involved in has been based. And Foley does that. I mean, any client that would 
pay me or the revenue that we get for that isn't worth hurting the reputation of the firm. And so we have a very specific, some people, that's why some people don't like to lobby or they don't want to work for big organizations like Foley. They'd rather be their own single shop. But we do an unbelievable conflicts check, not only to make sure that we don't have a conflict on an issue with another client that we might represent legally. I mean, again, we've got over 2,000 legal clients around the world. And so before I can engage with anybody, they have to check and make sure that my issue wouldn't be of conflict with anybody. But then we also kind of determine whether or not it's in the best interest of the firm as well. And again, I think our reputation has been out there. You know, we rarely do we have to turn down a client. I, I, I will share, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, when um, it, it worked out well, when I just left the legislature, a lot of groups that maybe didn't have a real good standing with the Republicans thought maybe they could have an in with me with the Republicans, and we turned down a lot of that work. Because we were just like, you know what, I, it, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna use my, um, so blatantly lose, use my personality or my relationships there to help a group that maybe we as a firm don't quite honestly get along with or support. So we turn that work down. <clears throat> and that's, again, cool. It makes me feel good about every day when I go to work. Yes? Um, putting aside Highway 23, the Kohler Health Crisis, that's an interest. Right. Um, twists and turns. Yeah. Any comments you might make about that? They could do some of your services. I've offered that. Um, but <laughs> they, uh, they employ a different group, and I'm not exactly sure what their strategy has been behind that, but that's fine. Um, I think they're in a bit of a mess. I mean, the new Evers administration and the new Evers DNR is not going to um, work to find a way to make that a possibility. Um, the, the Walker administration uh, and the DNR, they wanted to protect the environment and have a good environment in Wisconsin, but they always tried to find a way to have that environment work with the development or with the, you know, the, the economic opportunity that a development would bring about. That's really what their goal was, was to try to say, okay, can't this all work? And I just don't know if the Evers administration has that interest. I think that they're gonna be much more focused on just the environmental side of things and quite honestly, the emotional side of things. And I think it'll be hard for them to, to get over that. It seems like they have the wetlands trade-off yep. capacity. For right. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of, um, you know, they're now suggesting that the DNR under the Walker administration didn't use the right criteria to evaluate the environmental impact and all that stuff. And that's a lot of legal, <laughs> you know, throwing up against the wall to see what will stick. And unfortunately, I don't know if the Evers administration will challenge that that much. Any other questions for Joe? So let me just, two seconds, Steve. Today there is a public hearing down in Janesville, again, this is where if you're really interested in government, you gotta go sit at a joint finance hearing for a day. <laughs> I did it for eight years. Um, I was just gonna tell you where the other hearings are. I got them here somewhere, because there's a couple in the area, right? We've got one up in Green Bay coming up. And I apologize, I lost that list. But I would uh, encourage you as an organization in advance of next month when you're having your legislators in, you know, maybe get to a public hearing. Devin or Terry or Dewey would love to see some local faces there because <laughs> it's a welcome relief. And they've got a big, they've got a big uh, issue, a big budget on their hands here. So after four budgets of not having any tax increases in the state of Wisconsin while doing pretty good investments in most areas of government services, and after four balanced budgets, um, Governor Evers now has taken a little bit different approach. I mean, he's got a pretty aggressive tax increase plan in his budget, over a billion dollars in new taxes, um, 600 million some dollars in new fees, and it's already looking like his budget will have about a $2 billion structural deficit uh, going into the next budget cycle. So the legislature, I don't think, is gonna allow that to happen. I mean, after all the work that they've done in getting the state in the fiscal situation that it is right now, and you know, they could change, or it, there could be some changes, but it's hard to argue that we're not in a good fiscal situation in Wisconsin right now. I don't think the legislature is gonna allow that to be taken away uh, in one budget cycle, uh, but that'll be a key responsibility of Devin, Dewey, and Terry to try to figure out how they do that on behalf of the citizens of Wisconsin. So ask them some tough questions next month, and uh, I'm sure they're looking forward to coming home to tell you what's going on. That's it. Perfect. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon.